Virtual reality is a transcendental experience. What we're seeing is a shift in media paradigms from the curiosity of scheduled news reports to fully embodied real-time territoriality. Virtual reality is the future. Actually, no bullshit, no diggity, this is the most excited I've been to make a video in a long time! I have been told that the honeymoon period eventually ends, that the novelty of VR is supposed to wear off after a few weeks, and this stuff is all just one big cheesy gimmick, but I've had this PSVR set for almost a month now, and the honeymoon is still on. This stuff is amazing. But it is still prohibitively expensive. I never did want to buy any VR headset until it dropped under $300, and in early March an eBay discount code stacked with a pre-existing sale ran the PSVR camera bundle all the way down to about $175. But that's without the controllers, the games, and the giant gray toy gun that still meant that this pile of plastic, even on heavy sale, cost me somewhere around $370 on day one. If you're gonna buy just the headset on a normal day where it's $200, you still need that $30 camera. You still gotta get something good to play on it, like the $25 Super Hot VR, which requires the PS Move controllers, which are supposed to be $50, but my local GameStop charged me $100. At this point, even if you're dealing with honest merchants, and even if you buy a bundle, those controllers are probably going to bump it up to a $400 buy-in, and that's if you already paid the price of the console itself. It's worth noting that throughout most of my life, I have tried very hard not to be easily separated from my money. But after literal minutes playing demos in this thing, I rushed out to spend 7 bucks on a used copy of Battlefront just to play the VR X-Wing demo, and I don't regret any of this because this is amazing! I think we're finally climbing out of that mid-90s janky-ass 3D stage of VR, past the Alone in the Dark crap and Star Fox crap, and catching up to the years where the VR moniker is gonna get slapped on the end of a number of established names. And just like with early 3D gaming, I doubt everyone's favorite franchise is gonna be able to make the transition over. VR devs haven't standardized stuff yet, but they're gradually figuring it out. And I'm not assuming that VR gaming will inevitably become dominant. Thankfully, the genres of products the game industry is pushing out these days are way more diverse than they were in the 90s. There's a lot more developers with a lot more freedom with a lot more genres to play with than they did in the 90s. And because of the vast differences between VR genres and normal genres, I don't believe traditional gaming interfaces will go away anytime soon. But both the possibilities and improvements that VR can add to 3D gameplay are tenfold. To be honest, after a month, it has now become a little less exciting for me to be playing stuff that's not a full-body immersive VR proof of concept of something. I truly believe this is not a gimmick. The VR really does change how games are made and played at the bedrock in a substantial way not seen since the 90s. And their gameplay changes that are very capable of being enjoyed on PSVR hardware that's still technically budget level stuff. Whew, so, what do 300 pieces of rapidly decaying linen paper buy you these days? Only a 5.7 inch display capable of outputting 960 by 1080 pixels at 120 hertz per second burned through an RGB stripe matrix. So, while the resolution of this headset is slightly lower than that of the competition, that rectangular subpixel shape rather than diamond means that the pixels kind of bleed together a little better. You uh, don't see the lines between the pixels as well as you do through the other headsets, so the screen door effect is superior here, which means that the clarity of the image that you're getting is actually pretty competitive with the more expensive stuff on PC. And people are also finding it a little lighter, tighter, and faster to strap themselves into compared to the other headsets, so despite the lower price tag, it's more or less about the same quality as you'd expect from the higher-end PC stuff. Pfft, yeah, this baby's pretty much the Toyota Camry of virtual reality headsets. But if Sony's headset is the Toyota Camry of headsets, then their controllers are a 90s hatchback being sold by some guy who lives in a trailer in Clayton County. There is only one good thing about those controllers, and it's the little soft rubber bulbs at the, at the tip here. This means that you can fairly inconsequentially slap things around the apartment in virtual reality, and whatever you hit is, uh gonna have to stand up to this very, very pathetic piece of, of polymer that bends out of the way of its victims. It's actually a pretty nice safety feature. Two PlayStation Move controllers are 
pretty much required for the good VR games, and these things are old tech for a different purpose from eight years ago. I can't comment on how much more expensive the entire PSVR bundles would have been if they had better controllers, but Sony has filed a patent for them in January. I suspect what's really happening is that Kevin Butler has warehouses full of this crap they weren't able to sell last time. Without an analog stick, devs can't really straight up convert traditional locomotion onto these things. The button placement isn't the classic PlayStation layout you've gotten yourself used to, and having to swipe through menus works like only half the time. It's especially ironic that during the last gen, the PS Navi controllers actually did include an analog stick for exactly this purpose, but without a big blue rubber bulb squeezed onto the tip, it can't be tracked. And VR games have converged on at least one control standard, tracking both the player's hands. Not just one, like from the Wii days. But these soft rubber bulbs are needed because this is how the PSVR tracks your hand positioning. There's basically a webcam on top of your TV that's looking for a little circle of blue and orange light. That's how it tracks your X, Y, and Z, helped out by accelerometers and gyroscopes inside the controllers themselves. Which all sounds fine and good on paper, but let's look at that setup screen again. The camera's field of view is too low. No matter where or how I place this thing, and I eventually just settled on top of the TV looking a bit downwards and I had to move my freaking couch out of the way, I still just cannot get it to have both the top and bottom of my arm spans in frame. If I step back far enough to actually do it, I'm suddenly out of the play area. This is really unfortunate for a video gaming experience that requires players to interact with physics objects affected by gravity that have them end up resting on their most natural resting spot, which is the, uh, ground? I guess the costs of even modifying the old tech for a new generation was too expensive for them, but Here's some ideas. Slap a fisheye lens onto the camera. Slap a navi onto the navi. Slap myself whenever I turn around and the camera can't see my hands anymore. Or just slap a cheap $4 webcam in the box to put behind you to supplement the expensive camera in front of you. But they still would have needed to install some kind of wireless interfacing equipment in this thing to get it to talk to the HMD, and that would require manufacturing work, and it's pretty easy to tell that Sony wanted to do no manufacturing work at all unless it was for the headset itself because, uh, this thing is a much higher quality than everything else you get in the box. Also, it is worth mentioning that you can hook this up to a PC. It uses fairly basic standard USB and HDMI ports. There's a program called Trinus VR that can fool your computer into thinking it's an HTC Vive. Be aware though, your mileage with that may vary. For some reason, back when I first bought this thing, Trinus crashed on launch. Now it just works? So once I see what I want to see out of the PSVR library, I'll see what I can wing with it on PC. Anyways, what about the setup of the console? Well, the biggest issue there is that after plugging in the camera, plugging in the headset's HDMI from its separate processor box, and plugging in the processor box via USB, and then plugging in the motion controllers for charging, you... Wait a minute. At some point early on in the setup process, your PlayStation's holes will be filled. Even if you have the PS4 Pro, the uh, PlayStation VR experience has you cycling through three different controllers here, but I only got one hole to charge them in, so have fun figuring that problem out. The weirdest thing about this weird combination of low-end and high-end hardware is that super high-end, super expensive, room-scale VR PC gaming software actually works on this setup. Well, it, it tries. It tries so hard, and it's adorable how nearly every PC port is clearly testing the limits of this thing. You got about five by four and a half feet of walkable real estate, but prepare to see some glitches in the matrix once you move outside that tiny box. So, Sony's solution to this problem was to contract out games made for this thing, this giant gray toy gun controller that uh, has a couple analog sticks taped on. This thing grounds your position in real life. It keeps you standing still and pointed at the camera, and it's a shame because very, very few games are going to make the most of this thing. Far Point is currently your best bet with it, but based on how confusing the gun controller's controls were implemented in Arizona Sunshine, I'm not exactly getting my hopes up that this hardware will become regarded as a necessary accessory like the Move controllers are. And that's unfortunate, because playing Far Point with that giant plastic gun was one of the few PSVR experiences where everything just worked. With no calibration issues and no visual weirdness, an analog stick slapped onto a gun-shaped controller with a nightlight slapped on the tip means you don't gotta do a lot of real-life rotating to disorient yourself from your fake in-game rotating. And the option to blur the screen while doing these turns also cured me of motion sickness. This is the one game where fast locomotion, quick snappy turning, and reflexive shooting were all comfortable, responsive, and nausea-free. Even for multiplayer death matches. And that's all because of the controller. Other games aren't so lucky. 
Because of the PSVR's one crappy camera, and because of those two crappy move controllers, PSVR games have to employ a few tricks to make some compromises. And the one recurring constant thought that's in the back of my head whenever I play this thing that does kind of break the immersion is that I have to make sure I'm facing the camera. Despite that, you are often tempted to step out of view and wander off, but you can't. So, Rec Room, for example, keeps an arrow on the ground to remind you of the angle where the camera's looking at you from. Superhot puts a red circle on your IRL starting spot where gameplay objects will always appear between yourself and the TV. Farpoint does show us a pretty promising picture of what a Halo FPS campaign would look like if it was made for the ground up for VR and how different game design is going to become because of that. Enemies, obstacles, and visual events are almost always placed in front of the character, where the PS camera is going to be in real life. That influences level design, it influences story design, and especially enemy design. This game's version of head crabs rush up and jump up at your face like a head crab thing usually would, but then they run right the hell back where they came from into your line of sight. But that goes without mentioning all the extra little moments of unscripted motion-based moves that VR gaming brings to the table. Actions that would have required a button press before are now naturally tracked body motions, creating unscripted gameplay scenarios that, if they wouldn't have been button presses before, or actions that would have been first-person unplayable cutscenes before. In Resident Evil 7, you can peek through tiny peepholes, peer around corners, and go real careful and slow to fully enter the survival horror. I mean, these are first-person head movements that have been emulated since the days of Amnesia, but in VR, they're not a button press, they're a ubiquitous cross-game feature that everything shares. For shooters, what'll soon become obvious is that blind fire is now a very legit strategy, something you'll rely on a lot, and something that'll feel really good successfully pulling off. There was a moment in Rec Room, which is surprisingly one of the best VR games out right now, if not one of the best free-to-play games out right now, too, where an enemy shot a gun out of my hands that landed between everyone's crossfire, and I had to get down on my hands and knees and crawl for it underneath all the tracers flying over my head. Horror is very enhanced in VR, where monsters are life-sized and constantly threatening to appear behind your shoulder. There are a few moments where I've screamed in Resident Evil 7, and I have not screamed at a horror game since adolescence. I was giggling like a child when realizing the childhood dream of being in a fully controllable X-Wing cockpit from Star Wars! Which is a testament to how different visual design is going to be. You can tell this was made by a Hollywood prop designer and not a video game designer. There was a moment in, what, what else but Rec Room, where me and two friends had to fight this big swamp boss that had everyone physically moving their arms all over to exhaustion. And that ended with the three of us kind of relaxing around a campfire afterwards and chilling out by necessity. For some reason, it feels rude not to look at other people when they're talking to you in VR. And the feeling of co-op camaraderie is also enhanced in VR, where everyone has to suffer, toil, and tire together because VR gaming is inherently more physically active. Four years ago, I made a video about fitness games, which were relegated to gamification workout scheduling apps for phones, and those were silly bullshit. VR, on the other hand, is the real deal. Here, physical activity actually feels good to pull off. In other words, these are real-ass video games that still require that workout. The challenges they present are fun and compelling and rewarding, and though it's not going to slim you down as fast as a real workout schedule would, we may see this stuff change the stereotypical gamer's waistband over the decades, and I genuinely do expect to lose a lot of weight over this year because of it. I can already feel how much better I feel after a few weeks of moving around instead of just sitting on my fat ass all the time. Two games that I can see myself genuinely making myself a better body with here are the pretty much essential Super Hot VR and the multiplayer matches in Sprint Vector. Sprint Vector is a kind of roller derby racing game where you do the monkey to go fast, and just like real athletic racing, this final sprint to the finish line has everyone spending all their stamina on a last minute burst. So for a lot of games, you're going to want to wear well-ventilated, comfortable clothing. You're going to want to regularly wash your face with a preventative acne rinse, and the motion sickness can be slightly improved with a bit of locally sourced ginger tea infused with good vibes. I now have enough experience to say that about an hour of smooth locomotion in VR is what it takes to make me feel nauseous. Turning on some kind of silhouetting cone in the peripherals actually cures that. And that makes long campaigns tolerable. There might have been no big, long, non-gimmicky, non-teleporting, non-turret-shooting VR games in 2016, but nowadays the VR campaigns in Moss, in Farpoint, and in Resident Evil can last for hours on end. Games like Sprint Vector and Rigs are designed as physically active multiplayer sports whose novelty can last for weeks. 
as could a competitive obsession with speedrunning and leaderboarding Superhot's endless arcade modes. Compared to two years ago, VR's software library has matured greatly, to the point where there's now more games that I want to play than what I think I have time for. But sadly, despite all the good vibes there are to be found, there was one big ticket port that did not provide them. Just one purchase that I can already tell that I do regret that does outline the limitations and the challenges of this janky ass platform. Arizona Sunshine is one of the most popular VR games on PC, but on the PS4 you're facing a constant sore reminder of just how far backwards graphics need to be scaled to maintain a critical 60 frames per second of head movement. It's jarring how some cheaper third-party games like this actually just don't track your controllers as well as the first-party Sony-sponsored stuff that was specifically built for the hardware. Sony's first-party studio in London made a demo called The London Heist, where your hands will be tracked smoothly and accurately. They'll be colliding into things with diligently mapped collision detection. These fingers are holding the same poses your own fingers are holding the controllers with, but then you load up something like Arizona Sunshine and suddenly those controllers are trembling in the air and clipping all over the place. It doesn't help that the game's smooth locomotion mode, which is the option I prefer, is relegated to the tiny X button on the controller. Your grab is the big chunky move button, which isn't consistent with nearly every other game on the platform, and without those buttons arranged in a directional plus sign pattern, it's uh, kinda hard to relate those buttons with directions while being blinded by a headset. The button to the upper right rotates your right. The button to the lower right ejects your magazine. My fingers oftentimes landed on the magazine ejection button in the middle of a fight when I meant to hit the rotate button, and where else would those magazines land but out of range onto the floor? Thanks. Rec Room's PSVR version, by comparison, is excellent. Smooth locomotion can be turned on by holding the big, obvious, easy, chunky move button, while your fingers to the lower left and lower right of that rotate you left and right. I had a far easier learning curve adapting to these controls instead, but it's still a less courteous solution than some first-party Sody projects that straight up show you your own controller right there in virtual reality, with big obvious button labels so you can know where your fingers are. But what all of those challenges and complaints and problems point to are situations that I think are scalable and interesting problems for both software and hardware developers to overcome. I mean, we're, we're now at a situation where 1080p is no longer good enough. In VR, that resolution means that you can only display four, four menu items in a list again, like you're playing Oblivion on the Xbox in 720p. This is nostalgic. For the first time in a long, long time, it feels like making slight improvements to graphical fidelity are going to yield substantial improvements to accessibility and depth and complexity. Improving the resolution and the frame rate and the tracking and the comfort of these headsets is going to make the next generation of VR games play differently from the current ones. Over the past 10 years, people have been complaining about how AAA gaming has stagnated since like Modern Warfare 2, and that probably hasn't been helped by how your hardware of the cutting edge modern era pretty much looks exactly the same as hardware from 17 years ago. Hell, it's, it's not even enough to say that VR has me excited about video games again. VR has me excited about video again. What's also available here on the PSVR is a library of VR video content from YouTube and other apps where you can fly through space and the ocean and the White House and travel the world with 360 degree documentaries. Exploring VR videos was actually what convinced me that, well honestly for real, no diggity. Virtual reality is the future. I believe this format of video will be normal one of these decades. If not now, then certainly at some point where the convenience hurdle is jumped because this is simply a more efficient medium of communication. With one turn of the head, you can instantly learn the layout, lighting, atmosphere, and size of a room. You can read the abstract mood of a room. You can get a sense of claustrophobia and crowd sizes and body language. You can experience the charisma of celebrities and world leaders firsthand. You can experience a sense of planetary scale and scope that only astronauts have been able to talk about. This is why people love playing with Google Earth and VR so much. Internalizing the size and position of your own body to the subjects of a video makes for a more relatable, perhaps a more honest and empathetic medium of telecommunication, and the New York Times has jumped on board with a series of 360-degree video journalism that has you making intimate eye contact and stepping into the living spaces of everyone from Alzheimer's patients to Smithsonian researchers to the homeless of impoverished nations. 
Video itself becomes more powerful than VR. It's like going from silent movies to talkies, and media practices are gonna have to change to adopt to that. And how will movie studios adopt? How is the viewer gonna get involved with passive experiences from this perspective? Where should we be looking at, and what angles should we be expected to use? We truly live in interesting times, because over the next decade, people are gonna have to try to figure all this out. Virtual reality is surreal and wonderful, and I love it. It feels like the next frontier, not just in gaming, but in media itself. We're going from experiencing other people's stories as tiny rectangles on the wall to fully immersing yourself in other people's stories and humanizing those stories as life-size immersive experiences. It might take a few years yet. It might take a generation of kids growing up with this stuff in their formative years, but I do believe virtual reality is the future. This is gonna be so good. All right, I'm gonna zoom out. We're done. We're good. <laughs> okay. We did it. Rock on.